How did life begin? Was it spontaneously by chance, millions of years ago in a nutrient-rich sea, or was it created by an intelligent being? Of recent time, microbiologists have found that all life perpetuates itself by means of the DNA molecule. Now this molecule contains the entire genetic code for the reproduction of the organism. Here we see graphically portrayed the various ladder units of information of the DNA molecule. Now as we think of the origin of life, let's consider the simplest form of living matter known today. Scientists speculate that it contains 6,500 units or ladder steps in its DNA molecule. Now bearing this in mind, and assuming the ancient seas were just crammed with the base units of which DNA is composed, what would be the probabilities of all of these units aligning themselves in the exact perfect relationship of one to another to spontaneously form the simplest living organism? Well, to illustrate what would be involved, let's imagine we consecutively number a set of cards from 1 to 6,500, each representing a DNA base unit of the simplest living organism we know of today. We shuffle the cards thoroughly, toss them into a bag, and shake it some more, and then we throw the cards into the air. Now try to imagine what the probability would be for these cards to fall to the ground in perfect consecutive order, one to 6,500. That's what would have been required to bring about the spontaneous forming of the simplest form of life. You must admit, the probability isn't very great, which perhaps explains why that even with relentless experimentation taking place the world over, Life has never been produced in a test tube from non-living matter. But let's go on now to consider the fossils, fossils of the earliest living organisms. In the Precambrian rock strata where we have the first evidence of life, the only fossil evidence contained is that of single-celled algae, which we hear, see here greatly magnified. But now let's note carefully the gigantic leap that takes place in the next rock layer, the Cambrium rock strata. We jump from single-celled algae in one rock layer to highly complex animal organisms in the very next. As a matter of fact, every major invertebrate form of animal life is found in the Cambrium rock strata. 455 different species. But now the point we especially want to note is that there are no intermediate forms whatsoever to show a gradual evolving bit by bit from one species to another. But rather, all 455 are completely different. Well, let's go on now to consider another unanswerable problem that confronts our paleontologists, that of the sudden extinction of the reptilian form of life. The fossils of the reptilian age show how great dinosaurs dominated the land. Flying reptiles glided through the skies and the seas were just alive with giant marine reptiles. But then suddenly, that entire world perished. The dinosaurs were exterminated by a worldwide catastrophe. Fossil bones of all these reptilian animals are found intermingled young and old alike throughout the world, showing that the reptilian age indeed came to a cataclysmic end. You know, that which is even the greatest mystery is that which supplanted this form of life. For the fossils in the very next strat of rock indicate a complete new form of animal life came into being. The mammal creation of animals that we have all about us today. In addition, there were very types of feathered birds of all colors, sizes, and shapes, and a complete new form of vegetation, that of flowering and seed-bearing plants. Think of that for a moment. Suddenly, we have these gigantic reptiles becoming extinct in a worldwide catastrophe 
And then, just as suddenly, with no gradual or intermediate forms of life whatsoever, in the very next strat of rock, we have a complete new form of animal, bird, and vegetable life comes into being. It would seem that this would be evidence of rather than a gradual, slow, bit-by-bit -bit process of evolution, there was an instantaneous creation of a new form of life in a new age by an intelligent creator. Now the next aspect of our study that we'd like to go into has to do with mutations. Now, according to evolutionary theory, it's mutations that have occurred within organisms over periods of millions of years that have caused the gradual evolving from single-celled algae up the scale to man. But you know, geneticists will all readily admit that almost every mutation that takes place is harmful to the organism, not helpful, because in reality what it is is an error or a mistake in the transfer of the genetic code. Now with that in mind, does it seem logical that the complex organisms that we see all about us have evolved because of mutations to become such beautiful masterpieces of engineering, beauty, and design? Can this, the most marvelous miracle of life, be the result of mistakes or errors that took place in the genetic code transfer of that original single-celled algae? Let's look into that just a little deeper. Let's consider the mutations that would have had to have taken place to evolve from sea-dwelling amphibians, which laid their eggs in water, to land-dwelling reptiles, which laid their eggs on dry ground. The simple change of the form of an egg will illustrate, we believe, the unreasonableness of mutations being able to bring it about. As the egg changed from one in water to one on, laid on dry ground, it still needed to have water or else it would have dried up long before it was hatched. It also needed a lot of food. And so the reptilian egg had to be provided with a large mass of yolk for food and also albumin, the white of the egg to provide the water. Moreover, the egg white needed a vessel to contain it. And so there had to be a shell made of a hard, limey material. You know, the shell caused another problem. The original amphibian embryo, which was in the sea, could easily get rid of its waste products through its soft outer covering. But now, with the hard shell of the new reptilian egg, it was impossible to pass waste products through the shell. And so it had to be provided with a kind of bladder. It's called the Elantuis, and is in many respects similar to the mammalian placenta. But this problem having been solved, the embryo would still remain trapped inside its tough shell. Now it had to evolve a tool to get out. And so snakes and lizards have a tooth, transformed into a kind of shell opener, while birds have a carnicle a hard outgrowth near the tip of their beak which serves the same purpose. Well now, as we consider just this one possible aspect of the evolution of reptiles, let's observe how each factor is essential. The liquid store in this egg would make no sense without the shell. And the shell in turn would prove to be fatal without the bladder and the shell opener. In other words, they're all interdependent, one upon the other, and they would have had to have occurred simultaneously. You couldn't, for instance, have one mutation occurring all by itself and preserve this to become the shell of the newborn egg, and then wait a few thousand years until the second mutation joined it to provide the albumin, and a few more thousands of years until the third mutation produced the lantuus, and so on to the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Each mutation occurring by itself would have been useless, and it would have been wiped out long before it would have combined with the others to form the new reptilian egg. The theory that they're coming together was due to a series of blind coincidences 
is truly contrary to the basic principles of scientific explanation. But let's go on now to consider other marvels of what we believe to be the creative work of an intelligent being. Think of all the intricate components, controls, and human ingenuity needed to navigate today's giant airliners. And then think of the navigational system in this tiny brain which guides many birds as far as 20,000 miles and then returns them back to the very nest in which they were hatched. How far can you and I travel without maps and compasses before we get lost? And yet these tiny brains have the memory to guide many birds 40,000 miles without a map. How did this tremendous capability come about? Was it mere coincidence? Was it because of a mistake in the genetic code transfer? Or was it intricately planned by intelligence and then created? Well, let's go on now to the most complex creature in all the animal kingdom. We find that the theory of evolution proposes that man evolved from a primate to become the modern man. But again, it's common knowledge that paleoanthropologists will all readily admit that they have yet to find the missing link from anthropoid ape to man. Let's consider some of the skeletal remains that have been found, many of which are very close to human and yet they're just a little different and are therefore supposedly to be indicators of evolution. But how many of these could have been the result of disease or deformities caused by mutation? Even as this medical textbook shows still occurs in our advanced society. Would they be a missing link for the evolving man? No, far from it. Other times, primitive implements like stone tools are found with skeletons and these are used to substantiate the theory of a prehistoric caveman that lived perhaps as much as a million years ago. And yet today, in this modern, so-called highly civilized age, we still find in odd corners of the earth people on all levels of culture, some that are extremely primitive, some from complete nudity, to some in royal dress of kings, some who use only simple tools, while others send rockets and men to the face of the moon, and some who live in mere leaf windbreaks, while others live in giant hotels. No, cultural sequence is no proof for evolution. But rather, we believe that the marvelous miracle of life could have only have been brought into being by a living source, a master chemist, a master physicist, a master biologist, a master lawgiver. Everywhere we turn about us today, we find laws that govern our universe. Magnetism, gravity, physics, chemistry, biology, the elements, the very building blocks of our universe are all governed by fixed, unalterable laws. Why, we ask, are there fixed laws that govern every science about us? Why isn't there ever random behavior when all are supposedly to have been brought into being by blind, random coincidence? But in this point in our study, we'd like to go on to consider the book that claims to be written by the inspiration of an intelligent creator. You know, it only seems logical that a creator that would give us a mind to reason, to think, to wonder where we came from and just why are we here and where are we going, that he would also give us the answers to our deep-rooted questions. This we find he has done in the book we call the Bible. But you know, in this regard, I realize that there are many sincere people who have difficulty believing the Bible. And the reason is that they have been told that the Bible teaches that if you do not believe in God and His Son, you'll be tortured for billions of years of eternity in a hell of fire that He has created. Well, this thought has troubled many and perhaps yourself. For as we examine the Bible, we find it teaches that our Creator is a God of love, 
of sympathy, a God of compassion. How then could he design a plan that would include a place of eternal torment? Our society abhors the idea of torturing even the worst criminal. Thus, it's easy to understand why some would have difficulty in believing in such a being. Because when they see the beauty, the harmony and the wonder of nature, and the preciousness of life, it's beyond them how this same being could then bring into existence such a condition as a hell of torment. But is this the scriptural teaching? Is this what our great creator brought into being? No, far from it. But rather we find that this is a teaching that has come to us from far back in the dark ages from tradition and because of mistranslations in the King James Bible. And it's nowhere. I repeat, it's nowhere taught in the Bible. But rather, we find the word hell in our English King James Bible is translated from the Hebrew word sheol. Now, notice how this word was translated three different ways in the King James Bible. This is quite enlightening. It was translated grave 31 times, hell 31 times, and pit three times. So first of all, we notice that it's inconsistent. But you know, even more important for us to note is when was it translated grave and when was it translated hell? Well, you know, every time the King James translators translated Sheol in regards to a person who was righteous, it says that he died and he merely went into the grave. But if he happened to be wickedly inclined, they changed the translation. There it was translated that he died and he went into hell. But you know, in the original, they both went into the same place. Both the good and the bad, in other words, go into Sheol, which literally means nothing else but the condition of death, oblivion. Let's note Ecclesiastes 9.10 that describes what this condition of Sheol really is like. Now this is the Revised Standard Version which leaves the word Sheol untranslated so you can get a better picture of its actual meaning. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Now notice here how Sheol is described as a condition not of pain or torment, but rather one where there's no work, no knowledge, no wisdom, not even thought. And notice again the last line. It's a condition to which all of mankind go into, the condition of death. Now in the book of Job, we have a prophet of God a righteous man who actually prayed to go into the Bible Sheol. And the reason was that he was very sick and was in a terrible amount of pain. We read in Job 14, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in Sheol, that thou wouldest conceal me until thy wrath be past. Now notice, Job actually prays to go to Sheol. Was he praying to go to a place of torture? No, he just wanted to die and be at rest. Well, proceeding on, I can't help but think others are wondering, well, I thought that the Bible taught that man had an immortal soul, something within us that can't possibly die, and that's what goes to heaven or to hell upon death of the body. Well, this is what many people believe. But you know, again, nowhere is it taught in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the words immortal soul aren't, even the, aren't in the Bible even one time. But rather, the scriptures clearly say in Ezekiel 18.20 that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yes, if the soul that sins can die, how can it be immortal? And in Psalm 22.29 we read, None can keep alive his own soul. 
someone might say, well, at least this makes a little more sense than the idea that this great creator would torment someone's body or soul in a hell of fire. But if he's so powerful and so wise, why has he permitted all of the pain, the heartache, the sickness and death for thousands of years since man has been here? When God first planned man's creation, he no doubt thought of the best way to bring about man's willing obedience. For God didn't want to create robots who had to obey him, but rather he desired intelligent beings who would obey him through their own free will, their free choice. And so the plan that God adopted to ultimately bless all of mankind and to bring about their willing obedience was one not of force, not of coercion, but of education based largely on experience. God tried man representatively in Adam, full well knowing that man would fail the test because of lack of knowledge and experience. And because of his fall, for the past 6,000 years, man has learned the terrible consequences of disobedience to divine law. However, God had not planned for man to remain forever dead. No, but rather, just as all mankind came under, under the death sentence through heredity because of the sin of one perfect man, Adam, so likewise the death sentence will be removed because another perfect man, Christ Jesus, was willing to give his perfect life as a ransom to redeem Adam. And thus we see how the scales of divine justice will be balanced. One perfect life given to redeem the one perfect life which sinned. And when that ransom price is finally paid into the hands of justice on Adam's account, the Bible promises us that every man, woman, and child that has ever lived on the face of the earth is going to be brought back from the dead to a kingdom here upon the earth. In that kingdom, they're going to be given perfect human bodies. They'll be guided, taught, and instructed in the ways of righteousness in this thousand-year period of perfection. And then at the end of this thousand years, they'll be put to the test again. But this time, the test will be on an individual basis. Man, having thus first experienced the consequences of evil in this present life, and then its opposite, the glorious results of obedience in that kingdom, man will truly have something to compare. Having experienced both the effects in, of good and evil, there's little doubt that the vast majority will be rightly exercised. They'll pass their test and they'll go on to live everlastingly in a condition of perfection here upon the earth. Well, you say, that almost sounds too good to be true. Do you have any scriptures to prove that there's going to be such a kingdom here on earth that all people will come back from the dead to? Well, let's trace a few of the promises of God regarding this kingdom. This kingdom is what is referred to in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, although this prayer has been repeated perhaps billions of times, many overlook the meaning of its words. Notice, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. Notice, in earth as it is in heaven. Most Christians believe in a heavenly salvation and resurrection for the footstep followers of our Lord, and this the scriptures clearly teach. But many overlook the fact that God has promised, in addition, an earthly resurrection for all the remainder of mankind. Notice Jesus' reference to the resurrection for all in John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in their graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Notice, all, all that are in their graves will come forth. Yes, they'll come forth to God's kingdom here upon the earth. 
In the 35th chapter of Isaiah, we have a beautiful, heartwarming picture of just what that kingdom will be like. And notice, it of necessity is referring to conditions right here upon the earth, not in the distant heavens. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert, notice, even the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And in verse 5 and 6 we're told, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as the heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Yes, then even the animal kingdom will rejoice. For the scriptures tell us that the lion and the lamb will feed together, and they'll be led by a little child. It will be a time when there will be no more scenes such as this. For we read in Revelation 21, 4, that in that kingdom God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. What a kingdom that will be. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that this type of plan is one that's completely harmonious with the great God of love that we would expect our Creator to be. But when will that kingdom come? Is it going to be millenniums away? No, that kingdom is going to come in this, our very generation. For the prophecies indicate that it is going to be set up during the lifespan of the people who are living when God will regather all the people of Israel from all the countries of the world, bring them back to their homeland, and reestablish them as a nation. That was back in 1948. Thus, we're on the very brink of the fulfillment of the greatest promise ever made to man, the kingdom of God here upon the face of the earth. What a wonderful plan. A kingdom in which God promises he will give an opportunity for everlasting life to everyone who has ever lived. For a free book that discusses the hope of God's kingdom in detail, call toll-free 1-800-GOD'S-PLAN. If you would like to know about our other publications, you can visit our worldwide website at www.chicagobible.org. That's www.chicagobible.org.